Cheers and salutations. My name is Kit. This is Americans Learn. And I know what everyone's going to say in the comment section below. Kit, you made a promise to stay in order. And unfortunately, I'm not. So before we start yelling at me, please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And hit that ring bell notification. That way all of you are made aware we upload new content onto our YouTube channel. And the video we are going to be checking out is titled Inmate 4859. <clears throat> I'm probably going to get his last name wrong. Witold Pilecki, Pilecki, Sabaton History, number 42 official. So, uh, first, the reason why I am out of order is because I saw an outstanding music video by Sabaton dedicated to this person. And uh, I think it's only fair, fair, that we find out the full history of who he is and the story of inmate 4859. So, uh, yes, I promise this time around, this time around, after this video, we'll go in order and everything will be fine. So, no more breaking promises, and that's a promise. Done deal? Good. Everything's all set. So grab yourself a tasty snack and a tasty beverage, and let's get ready to check out the history from Sabaton History. And please be sure to support the original content creators. That original link is in the description box below. So let's check it out. Counting down in three. A two, a one. A Vitold Pilecki is one of the great 20th century stories of bravery and sacrifice. And our song, Inmate 4859, is about the brave man, Vitold Pilecki. The story of Vitold Pilecki is as tragic as it Vitold Pilecki. That's how you say a name. Vitold Pilecki. It is heroic, and it is one for the ages. He was born in the Russian Empire near the Finnish border in 1901, spent his youth as part of the nationalistic Polish Pathfinders, and fought in independent Poland's new army against the Soviets in the Polish-Soviet War. He lived a peaceful life for much of the interwar years, but eventually returned to the Army Reserve and in 1939 was mobilized against the German invasion. Pilecki's Ulan Regiment was shattered by the advancing Wehrmacht, but he joined other Polish stragglers and kept fighting until the fall of Warsaw. In late October, he disappeared into the underground where he joined the resistance movement of the Taina Armia Polska, an arm of the Armia Krajowa, the Polish Home Army. Now, one of their tasks was to get inside knowledge about German prisoner of war camps, and one camp in particular in the small town of Oswiecim, Auschwitz in German, where many wow. Poles simply disappeared. It was suspected that they were sent to Germany as forced labor, but no one knew for sure. Pilecki came up with a dangerous plan. He would personally infiltrate Auschwitz, uncover the truth, and organize resistance in the camp. On September 19th, 1940, using the... Holy cow. That is, that is, that is absolute courage and bravery. I have... That is, that, that is dedication to a cause and to fight. Wow. Holy cow. What a hero alias Tomasz Serafinski, he intentionally walked into a German security sweep on the streets of Warsaw. SS men seized him, and the next day he was herded alongside other Poles into trucks at the Warsaw train station. All day they drove east, the men pressed together without food or water. Now, the rest of this story is told directly from the source material, from Pilecki's personal report about his experiences in the camp. It is not pretty. Arriving at the camp, Pilecki and the crowd of men were driven forward by brutal beatings from the guards. Some men were pulled out of the group at random, unprovoked, and shot in the head to break any thoughts of resistance. Accompanied by the laughter of the guards, they were then pushed on past the barbed wire and towards the parade ground, where a group of men 
in striped clothes was waiting for them. These men jumped the newcomers with fists and clubs. Some were actually beaten to death. The men in the striped clothes then asked them questions about their backgrounds and their jobs. And those who said uh, academics or doctors were knocked to the ground. With boots kicking against their heads, their murderers proclaimed that this is the concentration camp Auschwitz, my good man. Wow. His head shaved, Pilecki hurried out of the bathhouse, though a guardsman knocked out two of his front teeth because he did not hold the sign with his prison number between them. From now on, Pilecki was neither himself nor Tomasz, but a number, prisoner 4859. In his paper-thin blue and white striped uniform and a pair of ill-fitting wooden shoes, he found himself once again on the parade ground. There, he encountered the murderous men again. They were called capos, prisoner functionaries. Often German or Polish criminals, they were tasked with, let's say, keeping things in line inside the camp, since the regular SS men lived in barracks outside, right? Most of the capos were violent sadists who enjoyed brutally beating and torturing the helpless prisoners. Wearing yellow armbands with the capo label, they also oversaw the labor companies, to one of which Pilecki was assigned. In that labor company, it became clear that Auschwitz aimed to first exterminate the Polish intelligentsia. Prisoners with academic backgrounds who were not used to demanding physical work or who lacked the experience or the dexterity to work in the quarries were mercilessly beaten to death by... Um, first of all, again, I had no idea about Vital Pleski. Um, and what he did and the amount of courage it must have took to even take this operation at hand. Um, I don't think I was ready for this story. But I will salute this man for all the courage that he did just to make this heroic operation to find out what was happening in Auschwitz. That's a face of bravery and dedication and heroism. By the capos, being too exhausted to lift another brick or, or to push a wheelbarrow was also a death sentence. Every evening, fewer people returned to the main camp. Every walk to the latrines, every trip to the bathhouse was accompanied by beatings and harassment. Those who came late to morning parade or, or tried to hide away were hunted down, dragged to the parade ground, and either hanged or shot in front of the others. Many tried to kill themselves, usually early in the morning before the day of torture began. If anyone tried to escape, the whole block was punished for it, standing out in the open for hours or, or doing punishment sports where men too exhausted to lift their arms fell down and died under the boots of the capos. Often, the only time to catch your breath was when they were busy murdering another prisoner. Pilecki's good physical condition saved him from this fate, but for how long could that last? Well, Pilecki set out to build his first resistance cell, a group of five men. Later, he would create other fiver groups, but none of them knew of the existence of the others, so in case they were captured and tortured, they could not betray the whole network, right? Those groups would either organize food or clothing or would help other members to get a a job, since it was clear from day one that staying in the worker groups, the labor groups, even well-conditioned men like Pilecki would soon die. So many of those worker prisoners did in fact die that the prisoners had to build the first camp crematorium. Pilecki noted that the camp became one big mill which ground living people to ash. In 1941, as more and more prisoners were brought in, the camp grew. Larger fences were needed, more barbed wire and more guard towers. And as Auschwitz grew, it needed to feed itself. And this opened up jobs for the older prisoners. With careful planning, Pilecki got his fiber groups into the carpenters, the postal service, and the barbers. He eventually got himself a job as a repairman for an oven inside an SS man's house outside the camp. Upon leaving the living hell of Auschwitz, he returned to a world of, of lavish gardens, laughing children at play, and villagers having normal everyday conversations with one another. Huh. Oh man, that 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 would that would break my psyche.
that would break me going from that place to the outside world. Polensky felt the questions burning inside him. What was the real world? What, what was the real nature of man? What was the culture of the 20th century? Since mankind had advanced so far from the barbarism of old, how is this still possible? Or, or was this the true face of humanity? Would the whole world look like this if the boundaries of civilization disappeared? That is a serious question to ask. And unfortunately, humanity has a long track record of man's inhumanity to man. I wish it was something different. But humans have been doing this to each other for a very, very long time. I do hope for the day when there is peace, but... I don't think I'll be seeing that in my lifetime. Each morning, he and the other prisoners found themselves surprised to be alive. Their bodies thin to the bone, black and blue from the daily beatings, riddled with lice and fleas, living on a starvation diet. Only his daily mantra, you're not giving up, help Pilecki keep on and try to inspire others to do the same. Survival was only possible through friendship and mutual help. Loners died quick. Now, up until May 1941, it was possible for ordinary Poles to be released from Auschwitz, mostly by their families paying enormous sums to the Germans. Those released prisoners smuggled Pilecki's notes to the army at Krajowa. But when the war between Germany and the Soviet Union began, this stopped. Instead, new groups began arriving to the camp. Many were now Jews, and by the end of August, the first Soviet prisoners were transported to Auschwitz. Pilecki reports that one day, 700 officers were tightly packed into a room all day, till finally a group of German soldiers with gas masks on threw gas containers inside. This was the first act of gassing people with hydrogen cyanide at Auschwitz, according to Pilecki. Soon after, though, on his way to work, he passed groups of naked Soviet prisoners waiting to be led into the crematorium where they were gassed and burned. The capos were often brutal savages, but the bestiality of some of the SS guards was even worse. Pilecki tells of guard dogs trained to go for the throats of prisoners, the torture of smashing testicles with a hammer, and many stories far too nightmarish to tell here. Now with his cells set up in important positions all over the camp, Pilecki was ready to start a revolt, but he needed help from the outside to be successful. The prisoners were thirsty for revenge, and they were ready for anything since they did not fear death after all they had endured. But even had they managed to overwhelm the guards and take the camp, they would not be able to hold it for long. Pilecki believed that the Armia Krajowa had received at least one of his messages. He had urged them to stage an attack or, or, or send in paratroopers from the Free Polish Army over in Britain or, or drop a crate of arms onto them or something. But so far, nothing. Without help from the outside, Pilecki's third Christmas in Auschwitz came and went. And Auschwitz was now changing. There was no longer collective punishment, no outright murder, or even everyday brutality. Or at least it was toned down. See, Auschwitz became a factory, which would now systematically murder its prisoners instead of individualistic random killing. Again, you know, it's when you hear the history and the brutality, you're. Sorry, I don't mean to be quiet, but. You know, no one should go through that, okay? Simple as that. You know, and um, they're just given a nice censored version. I, I apologize for using the word nice. This is plain as it could be, especially. <sighs> it's sheer murder. And absolute evil. What happened to these people.
Not with the batons of the capos, but with phenol and gas. There were three crematoriums working simultaneously, able to burn corpses within minutes. By April 1943, more and more of the surviving Poles were sent out of Auschwitz to make room for Jewish prisoners from all over Europe and the Soviet Union. This meant the end of Pilecki's network, as its members were sent to other camps. So after two years and seven months of surviving in Auschwitz, Pilecki decided it was time to break out, since an uprising was no longer possible. He got a night shift job at a bakery outside the camp. Shortly after Easter, as one guard was asleep, he and two other men pushed the door open and ran. Shots cracked out behind them, but they ran all night and all day until they reached a small town. With help from patriotic Poles, Pilecki smuggled himself back to Warsaw, where, on August 23rd, 1943, after nearly a thousand days in Auschwitz, he met with commanders of the Armia Krajowa, telling them of his experiences, all the death, all the torture, but people hesitated to believe him. It seemed all too unbelievable, even for, even for the hated Germans to do all this killing. They knew it was bad, but not this bad. It was bad. Oh, my God. To even get that report. Wow. Um, you know, usually, uh, I have a lot more to say, but I shoot, if I was one of his commanders, I'd say, Hey, you've done enough. You, I think, I think you could sit all of this out. You've done enough, but he'd probably be telling me to F off and say, no, I'm not done yet. <laughs> Wow. Absolute bravery from this man. I'm glad to know his name now. Pilecki would stay in the underground army and fight in the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. He was later interned in prisoner of war camps and after liberation in 1945 was assigned to the second corps of the Polish army in Italy, where he turned in his report about Auschwitz to the British. For Pilecki, Auschwitz was the symbol of the Polish struggle for existence. He himself could never go back to a normal civilian life after experiencing what you've just heard. He maintained contact with the underground resistance, now against the Soviet Union, after the war, and indeed returned to Poland in late 1945 to report on the Soviet occupation. He lived and worked undercover, but on May the 8th, 1947, the Ministry of Public Security captured him. He was tortured and dragged before a kangaroo court and accused of, well, accused of many things, including espionage, and planning an armed oh, come uprising. on! The sentence was death. On May 25th, 1948, in the Mokotov prison in Warsaw, Witold Pilecki was executed. His final resting place remains unknown. In 1990, Pilecki and others from that show trial were rehabilitated, and today he is celebrated and with good reason, as a Polish patriot and a hero. Now, we cannot even imagine what he went through and what no. courage it must have taken. No. But man, that dude is made out of strong stuff. Well, that's a definition of a hero. To do so. It's a pretty heavy story, you know? Yeah, uh, I gotta be honest, over, I don't know how many people we researched for the Heroes album, but if there ever was a slam dunk, you know, part of my language, what the fuck moment, this was it, I would say. And it is, you know, the, the sacrifice is one thing, bravery is another thing, but doing all of that, I mean, think of the odds, I mean, getting in and getting out. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go <laughs> and, to Auschwitz on purpose. And then I'm gonna get out yeah. on purpose. And doing all that for a cause, and for what is, essentially, what is a noble and a just cause, any way you slice it. Yeah, and you know? I mean, I am so surprised also that how isn't there a major Hollywood blockbuster about this? That makes no sense at all. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. and people are coming up with, you know, 
Hollywood scripts. I mean, I'm not bashing the film industry here. Don't get me wrong. No, no, it's okay to bash the film industry. I mean, look, let's uh, at, at this point, it's okay, especially to bash Disney. Yes, that's right. I know, I know. I get to add in one humorous note. I'm allowed one humorous note to give a middle finger to Disney. All right, Dave. I there there are a whole bunch of incompetent people there at Disney and Lucasfilm. So it's so it's okay to kick them in the mouth. It's okay, Sabaton. You get a pass on this one. It's fine. It's fine. You get my green light of approval. Wrong. But I mean, people are making scripts that are less fantastic and not true. And still nobody. And this is a true this. story. And it's, even the tragic ending and stuff, you know, yeah. that's uh, I mean, maybe it, that's why they're not doing it. Well, they could throw in her like a romantic interest <laughs> or something. They could have Gwyneth Paltrow, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Romance in Auschwitz. Great. <laughs> 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 romance in Auschwitz. Two things that shouldn't be ever be mixed together. <laughs> Stranger things have happened in Hollywood. Yes, true. You know, but that leads you to wonder. I mean, you, there must have been romantic stories in, in Auschwitz. I, I guess so. I mean, we met a woman called Anna who fought in the Polish resistance. Okay. During the uprising. Yeah. She actually said that, yeah, there was, well, she was flirting with a guy in the middle of, you know, I mean, not as they were shooting, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, but, but, uh, I mean, but that's only, that's not 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Exactly. So, I mean, she said it's um, strange how, how man, or, you know, you can normalize such a extreme situation For and seven. life still goes on. You still go to the toilet, everybody understands that, but you are still actually falling in love while fighting or waging a war, you know? Yeah. Weird. And if this guy could break out, then of course you could break from the men's side to the women's side. Yeah. You know, it's nothing. I mean, if there's one thing this all proves is nothing is impossible. <laughs> nothing is as impossible as you think. I know, but it is. It's, you know, what would even more than just a Hollywood movie, it'd be a good miniseries. Yes. You know, actually, yeah. HBO, do you hear this? See? If anybody <laughs> HBO backs. Uh... Well, no, not Netflix. And then Netflix will find a way to screw it up. So HBO Max. I think HBO Max can do the job. <laughs> There's HBO's listening, and Yuki and I'll write it. I mean, I'm a writer, and he's he's good at emotion, so together we could we could do it. Yeah, but don't put me in, in acting in it because I suck as an actor. So, as we've noticed over these months of yeah. Sabaton history, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> um, what about the actual song itself, though? Uh, did did you decide on the, the topic before you wrote the song, or did you have the music sitting around and and uh, uh, wrote the music with Peter, our producer? Uh -huh. uh, okay. The first time we wrote a song together. And uh, him, you know, coming from, you know, Lindemann, Pain, Hypocrisy, those bands, and the harder side of things, uh, it became a bit of a harder and very, very dark song. So okay. as we were writing that song, I realized that this is the song. Because yeah. obviously, even though it's a very, very, you know, we're singing about a very courageous man, it would not have made sense at all to have a, you know, Proud, uplifting song yeah. for the subject. Yeah, you know? especially, yeah. I wonder what he was like as a person, like personality wise, because you don't, I mean, from the story, you can see, okay, he's got a lot of dedication. But you meet someone on the street, you don't know if they're a dedicated type person or not. No, you know? no, no. Courage comes in all forms. Remember that. So it would be, um, it would be really interesting. Well, uh, that's your homework, guys, to, uh, to go and uh, put the song on and think of Vito Piletsky. Vito Piletsky. That's all for today. Thank you very much. See you next time. R.I.P. Vito Poletsky. You know what? Hold on. I'm bringing up his image right here. That's the face of a hero. Dedication, strength, courage, wisdom, resilience. To do what he has done, I know that I could never, ever do what he did. That takes courage and commitment and an unbreakable will. And, you know, it's easy for all of us to say, oh, I could do this, I could do that. I, to hearing this man's story and what he went through, this man has earned my respect. I just wish he was rewarded with a long life. He deserved it. A long life to have a family children, grandchildren, 
and live to a good old age. He deserved it. That was taken away from him. But I think it's important for us to remember who he was and to live our lives as best as he can as we can. Not only for ourselves, but heroes like Vitold. So no matter where you're at in the world, make as much time as you can. And enjoy it. Because some people gave everything and they can't enjoy it. So, Vito Poletsky, inmate 4859, thank you for your bravery. Rest in peace. This has been Americans Learn. Please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And yes, I promise after this video, I'll go in order, uh, starting with uh, Sabaton History number four. That's a promise. So take care. I'm up out of here.